Good afternoon and welcome to CIO Leadership and Career Development Webinar Series, Deciphering Clinicians, a webinar tweet chat combo from a Health System CIO. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO and I will be your moderator today. We are having a simultaneous tweet chat hosted by Kate Gamble, our Managing Editor and Director of Social Media. You can participate in a separate browser or on your phone by using the hashtag HSCIOChat, or you can simply view the tweet chat in the Media Viewer panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll also be using the Q&A panel today. You can use that to send in your questions as they occur to you and leave the default set to all panelists, and we will look at those later in the program. And you can download the deck by using the URL on your screen. It's been sent out in the chat box, and it's at the bottom of our slides. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, first we're going to go about 35 minutes with our featured panel discussion with Sherry Hess, CNIO at Banner Health, Dr. Brian Patty, VP and CMIO at Rush University Medical Center, and Joel Venko, SVP and CIO at Bay State Health. So we are going to jump right into our featured conversation. Let's start with you, Sherry. Can you give us an overview of your organization and role? Yes, absolutely. Um, good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are. At Banner Health, we are a 28 acute care and critical access hospital over a six-state region um, that consists of behavioral health hospitals. Um, we also have our Banner Medical Group and Banner University Medical Group with uh, over 2,000 physicians. We approximately have between 17 and 18,000 registered nurses throughout our organization. We also consist of urgent care um, and uh, the largest, either the largest or second largest employer in the state of Arizona. Very good, thank you, and Sherry. My role. Sorry, oh, and then you said, and, yeah. and my role. So as the CNIO, um, what I'm responsible for here at, at Banner is to ensure that I create the strategy um, of any technology that touches our clinicians to ensure that it either improves their efficiency or our patient safety quality improves those patient outcomes. Also ensure it doesn't create roadblocks for um, our clinical staff. So I work closely with our CNOs throughout our, our regions, our CMIO, work very closely with our CIO, also IT, um, support education, just to make sure that we're meeting unified, in a unified way, our customer and clinician needs. Very good, thank you, Sherry. Brian? Uh, yes, so I, I am the CMIO at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. Uh, we are a large AMC and two community hospitals and uh, another uh, 43 uh, clinics. Uh, my role is uh, overseeing all the clinical ap uh, applications and um, and uh, devising uh, primarily uh, uh, involved with strategic uh, uh, planning for our um, uh, IT department uh, from a clinical standpoint. Um, I oversee uh, our entire uh, EPIC and clinical applications team as well as uh, a group of uh, eight uh, associate CMIOs uh, in uh, various uh, uh, areas uh, through inpatient uh, ED and ambulatory. Very good. Thank you, Brian. Joel? Hi, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, Joel Venko, I am the Senior Vice President and CIO of Bay State Health, which is a large health system in Western Massachusetts. Uh, it is also an academic medical center. Uh, we have uh, five hospitals, uh, a little over 95 uh, small practice organizations or clinics. We have a health plan of about 170,000 members. We also have a, a medical school that we started about uh, two years ago. Um, now and uh, focused very much on population health and primary care. Um, my role is, as uh, any standard CIO's role is, uh, very focused on the technology, but also on strategy, um, very recently on consumerism. Um, I also oversee our, uh, our innovation center, TechSpring, uh, which I founded about four and a half, five years ago now. Uh, and I'm also the chairman of our um, joint venture with a, uh, another IT firm, 
uh, and we call the, the joint venture Baytech IT. It's, a, it's a, basically an IT managed services provider for small practices. Uh, and also, I am the chair of uh, our Pioneer Valley Information Exchange, which is our regional HIE uh, here in Western Massachusetts. Very good. Thank you, Joel. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Brian, let's start with you. Before you came to IT, what were the best and worst experiences you had dealing with it, and what made you want to go into IT? Um, so, before I went into IT, so that was about 20 years ago, by the way. Um, no, I... Um, I was very interested uh, in evidence-based uh, uh, medicine, evidence-based practice, and um, I saw um, our early IT uh, implementations being very uh, non-standardized and very uh, um, uh, uh, what I called eminence-based rather than evidence-based. Uh, and, and so I got involved early on in developing uh, uh, order sets and other standardized uh, uh, practice tools and uh, making sure that we were uh, using the best and most recent evidence in uh, the uh, design of our, our uh, IT implementations, specifically with CPOE, but uh, uh, across the board. And so, uh, and that kind of got me, uh, once I started designing the order sets, then they, uh, they wrote me into starting to train the physicians on how to use the order sets, and then they wrote me into kind of pretty much everything else, and before I knew it, it was a full-time job. <laughs> So I uh, kind of, kind of wa walked into it kind of uh, backwards, but uh, uh, have enjoyed the ride. So any, any bad experiences that you had that you said to yourself, you know what, th this is not how it should be, and it, help, it helps today to inform how you act, how you do your job? Yeah, when I, uh, I took my second uh, uh, CMIO job, uh, and, uh, when I uh, landed the job, I found out afterwards that the reason they'd brought in the role of the CMIO uh, was because they'd had a uh, failed uh, uh, EHR implementation. Um, and uh, they had to deinstall the EHR, and it was primarily because the uh, uh, IT team at the time really didn't get any clinician input prior to going live with the EMR. Uh, and so <laughs> um, I think that uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, it was a good learning experience for me because uh, coming into uh, a job which I, I didn't know at the time but, but was a, uh, a firestorm already uh, brewing, and so it was a matter of uh, uh, kind of going out, talking to all the physicians, uh, talking to the IT shop, and getting the two sides to talk to each other. Uh, and uh, ultimately, two years later, we had a very successful uh, uh, EHR implementation. So um, it was uh, a, a, a good lesson in uh, involving clinicians early in the d design of, uh, of any uh, implementation. Very good. Sherry? So I came into this uh, going into IT, I would say probably more of a, a non-traditional way. So in the 90s when I was uh, a NICU nurse, I wanted to get my master's degree and I was you know, doing some online searches and I decided I'd get my master's in information systems. So I went to the University of Colorado, graduated, in 2000, and actually at that time when I was in the NICU, the organization, the hospital that I was at, we had gone live on nursing documentation. I can't say the whole EHR because we hadn't at that point. Um, and after a year on that um, documentation system, we actually went back to paper. The nurses and the neonatologists got together and um, they decided it wasn't in the best interest um, to be electronic. So I didn't even know at the time when I was getting my master's in information systems that I could even put the two together. I was actually looking for roles outside of healthcare when a, I met a guy in my class who worked for McKesson in the Boulder area and he said, hey, they're looking for you know, someone, would you be interested? I'll introduce you to the, um, the manager of that area. And um, in 2000, actually my last semester, I actually 
started with McKesson. So I didn't go in this as your typical where you see someone being a super user or, mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Patty talked about, you know, more being involved in that. I, I did reach out to the IT department where I was to say, hey, I'm getting my degree. Um, maybe there's an opportunity for me because I'd been there for about 10 years at that point and I really didn't hear anything from them. So I went on to work at um, – McKesson. So as far as worst or best experiences, you know, I don't really remember a lot of interaction in the 90s with IT per se because, you know, we weren't, there wasn't a lot that we were doing. It was more kind of probably biomed, but I did go back um, and work in the NICU a couple shifts a month from 2007 to 2011 you know, just to keep my, my nursing skills up and, and being involved in another EHR implementation. And so I would say at that time there wasn't anything that came to my mind. It just was more around how to get a hold of them, right? It, while in theory it sounds easy, just pick up the call, the phone and call them. Even a couple of minutes, you know, away from bedside care can be a bit problematic. So I don't really have any horror stories. and. Mm -hmm. um, I think overall I've been fairly lucky with the folks that I've dealt with in IT. All right, very good. Joel, how did you wind up coming to healthcare IT? Uh, I think most, uh, as I think the other two, Brian and Sherry, had mentioned, it's, it's sort of a, a backward sort of, you know, entrance, entrance into it. I, you know, I certainly uh, wasn't planning on going into healthcare IT. I think at some level it can be torturous, so it's, it's not something that I'd wish upon, you know, everybody. But but you know, actually, my my uh, my initial foray with healthcare was uh, I was in the MD PhD program back in 2000 2001, and I first got exposed uh, to uh, to basically informatics early on informatics uh, in you know during the summer of my second year going into my PhD year, and uh, my thesis advisor um, uh, actually brought me into uh, an organization uh, which was called Eclipsis. Probably some folks online mm -hmm. remember Eclipsis. They were bought by Allscripts, but they were one of the early HIT companies. And, and you know, my focus was actually on uh, creating um, a disease progression algorithm that I could sort of wrap my thesis around. And um, anyway, long story short, I, I, go into, I go into Eclipsis. He says, "Hey, we've got a thousand customers. They got great databases. Take a look." And you know, I cracked open the first database and the next one and the next one, and none of the data, met, you know, made any sense. They were in the wrong places. There was no standardization. It's the interoperability issue that we face today, and that really turned me on to uh, to informatics um, and really took, really about data and analytics. That was really my first passion and love, uh, and uh, it kind of turned into INT or IT because I, I realized that I couldn't really uh, make um, – you know, make hay with data or, or own the data until I own the infrastructure. And I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I ended up taking on bigger and bigger uh, positions uh, focused on uh, on technology. And, uh, and and so it's really about the data and analytics for me, ultimately, and, and that kind of drew me into to IT. And I don't regret a, a single day of it, of course, because it is a, a passionate problem without a doubt for all of us. But data and interoperability was sort of what led me into IT. Very interesting. It, just, it sounds like the the desire to organize chaos is uh, what you brought Brian in a little bit with the evidence-based guidelines to organize, to, to systematize process and for you seeing the data all over the place that could be useful if it was organized properly. So it's, you know, those instincts that some people have to organize and systematize. Sounds like some common common threads there. So let's start, uh, let's go with you, Brian, on this. Um, what do you think are some of the most common mistakes that I, um, IT people make when interacting with clinicians? I think, I think the most common one I see is just forgetting the time constraints that clinicians are under. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, typically when something, when something goes wrong, they're taking care of a patient right then and there. Uh, and to uh, not have an immediate response uh, is uh, highly frustrating for clinicians to get those issues resolved, uh, you know, to be put on hold uh, uh, from, from a help desk line or to, uh, you know, to not have somebody immediately be able to correct their, their problem. I, I, I built a team at my uh, previous organization 
where I had uh, uh, experts in the physician workflow uh, actually out in the field. They were all uh, from a nursing background primarily, uh, uh, both ICU and ED nurses, and uh, uh, they were uh, highly trained in the physician workflows. And when a physician called the help desk, we, uh, uh, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., we guaranteed somebody at their elbow within five minutes. Uh, mm. to resolve their issue if the help desk wasn't able to resolve it immediately. Uh, and that was, it was, uh, um, you know, you need to have that type of response for clinicians because when they get stuck, uh, they may not be able to continue care uh, for a patient uh, until that issue is resolved. And so just understanding those time constraints uh, and understanding uh, the immediacy to, uh, uh, to resolve issues, but also to design efficient workflows uh, so that uh, the, the, you know, our clinicians, our physicians, and our nurses are spending more time with the patient and less time with the computer as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Um, Sherry. Yeah, what, you know, a few things that I've seen over the years, um, whether it is a clinician or a nurse that works in IT, um, who has been away from the bedside, you know, for, you know, X number of years. One of the things that, you know, I like to even get our IT folks to remember, um, whether you're informatics, builder, educator, that we aren't the experts anymore, right? We need mm. to um, allow those that are at the bedside because things have changed. Now, you could say, you know, I'm not saying that's always a lot, but we want them to feel as though they're that decision maker. And I think the other thing is when you have an IT person that is a non-clinician, you know, create a relationship with that, that nurse, that physician, that, that pharmacist, um, to show that you really want to understand from them, that you see them as that subject matter expert. And that what you bring to the table is you want to gather that information from them in order to then provide them the best solution that you can. When, you, when I've seen IT folks, um, I'm just going to use the word fail or not, ha not be able to get where they want, it's because they're coming across as, you know, hey, I know this technology, this is going to help you. Well, you may know that technology, but have you spent 12 hours at the bedside mm, or in right. a clinic or, you know, with that patient, right, when, you know, you're comforting them? So I always think it's important whether you're that clinician in IT or you're that technical person, create that relationship, show them that you do care and you do see them as that expert, and you're going to bring to them options for them to make decisions. Very good. Very good, Joel. Yeah, I agree with the, the Sherry and Brian. I, I, you know, I, I would just add that uh, a couple things. One is, you know, I think that a common mistake is is that as, as an IT professional, you you tend not to speak the language of the clinician or of the business. So, rather than IT speak, you know, talk about uh, things that matter or that relate to the individual in um, in their language. Um, but similarly. You know, we don't talk about value of a specific uh, technology or analytic or capability. We talk about functions often. Um, so don't talk about functions, talk about the value. Um, and to Sherry's point, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, technology doesn't fix it all. And it's, it's never the silver bullet for sure. Um, and certainly it won't make a clinician's uh, day uh, often, but it certainly can provide some level of value. And if you can talk or collaborate on value, that, that makes a lot of difference. Um, you know, the other thing that I, I tell my staff is, uh, you know, collaborate with clini your clinicians, collaborate with your partners, uh, because just, just because it works for you doesn't mean it works for them, right? Um, I often tell them, because you got through it doesn't mean that they can get through it, right? So there's, a, there's often a, a, a mis- understanding uh, by, uh, by technologists that, you know, I made it through by clicking and, and I got to the end and so everybody can be, everybody should be able to do it and that's never the case. It's usually not the case. Um, so always think about your, your user, think about your partner um, in their shoes, if you will. Um, and, and, you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's about uh, collaborating as, as the others have stated. 
um, you know, always, always focus on going beyond your cube or your office and getting into the, into the user's um, place of work or, um, you know, getting into their shoes so that you can ensure that you're developing a solution or, or collaborating a solution that is, is uh, the best for them. Very good. Sherry, you made an a interesting point about um, even though you may be a clinician working in IT, the farther you get removed from actual patient care, the more you need to reconnect or trust those that are still involved in patient care um, as opposed to remembering how it was when you did it, you know, three, four, five, six years ago. Um, you want to expand on that a little more? Sure. Um... It really, in my mind, and just had a conversation today about this, is, is um, who are, you know, what, what's your governance and who's the decision makers, right? So I think it goes to Joel's point around value. We have more work coming at us, if you will, than we have enough, you know, resources, time, and money. And so as you um, really think about what is that, that value that's brought or those decisions that come up, let's utilize those different areas, you know, around safety, quality, is it financial, is it efficiency, and get those um, clinicians that we together as a team can then put together uh, to create that value to then also give them the ability to help um, make those decisions. What, what I always see works best, and I think it goes to a lot of what Joel and Brian have said, is, you know, it's that combination. I appreciate um, the folks in IT that have some technology information that I don't necessarily have, or my clinicians that, like I said, I was a NICU nurse. I didn't, you know, spend time in the ED. I was never in a clinic. You know, I can go and observe there and provide input and feedback because someone that's in it, that nurse that's in that role every day, they also don't know what possibilities are out there. So there's also times where I see we ask nurses because we want to get their input, hey, as opposed to this computer on wheels or this computer at the bedside, what, what would you like to use? Well, when you make something so open-ended like that, they don't know what possibilities are out there, and then we go down a road that doesn't necessarily meet their needs. So where I see it really come together is when we truly collaborate, look at what that value we're going after, um, provide that information or get that information from our clinical staff, and then make that decision to move forward. Very good. Brian, uh, Sherry makes a lot of very interesting points. Um, just because someone is a clinician working in IT does not mean they worked or understand a particular workflow in any one of a particular areas that the application, for example, is being rolled out. So if you were a NICU nurse, doesn't mean you understand what it's like in surgery, right? So you can't assume you do. Uh, and you might, not, you might even have uh, different levels of staffing. So you may have had experience in a fully staffed unit and you're rolling things out in areas that are understaffed, and you expect those users to still be able to handle things the way you remember you could. There's all sorts of differences. I think one of the interesting points is this living the life, shadowing, experiencing for, you know, in a real way what these clinicians that you are rolling things out to are living every day. And some people talk about rounding or shadowing, but give me your thoughts around, around those dynamics. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, w workflow is everything. Um, and uh, having a deep understanding of the workflow of all the different workflows is, is really impossible for any one individual. It's one of the reasons that I started my uh, associate CMIO program here. I wanted to get physicians from various workflows, uh, various unique workflows across the organization involved in IT. And so I have, you know, uh, in inpatient hospitalists, uh, surgeons, uh, anesthesiologist, uh, ED physician, um, uh, a pediatrician, uh, a primary care physician, you know, trying to get a team of uh, physicians that report up to me that understand those unique workflows. Mm -hmm. um, and because, uh, cause, uh, you know, there's no way I... Uh, I 
I can have that deep understanding. And so each of those team members, those C associate CMIOs reporting up to me is about a, a, a 0.2 to a 0.5 uh, on IS, but the rest of their time is clinical. So they're using the system. They're involved mm. in those workflows. They understand the pain points, and they're able, uh, because of their advanced education, we put them all through EPIC's the Physician Builder course and, and the uh, um, Power User course at, at EPIC. And so they understand EPIC deeply, and they can, uh, they can translate uh, from our providers in the field to our analysts what needs to happen. Uh, and, and it's so critical to have that deep workflow understanding uh, and uh, have those uh, uh, eyes out in the field that are translating that information back to your team. Very good. Joel, um, for full disclosure purposes, I am married to a nurse practitioner who works in a hospital in the uh, cardiothoracic surgery unit, so she sees the patients before and after surgery and manages them to a large degree. And so I hear quite a, quite a few uh, stories. Um, and to, I would say if I did not have that connection, I would have no clue what what clinicians deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It would be totally inconceivable to me to imagine the kind of pressurized, frenetic environment that they deal with. So um, that being said, um, what do you do or how do you try and make sure that people on your team truly understand the lives of the people that they're servicing? Yeah, um, you know, and that's been a challenge uh, for us. Uh, and I think one way, a number of ways that we've begun to to really sort of crack that is, um, number one, you know, we've we've developed this layer of uh, of a sort of team uh, that we have uh, in IT that we call the business relationship managers, and these BRMs uh, are, are kind of like account managers, if you will, um, you know, in vendor speak. Uh, they represent, they translate, and they are, are inside of uh, specific domains or areas uh, within our health system. Uh, and, and so they be, begin to be the representatives for those uh, clinical voices um, out in the field. Uh, they're with them. They watch their workflows. Uh, they report back uh, to, you know, central IMT and informatics. Uh, and, and so they're inside of the, the, the belly of the beast, if you will. They're within the, um, they're inside of the field. Um, as well as uh, sort of Brian's point, you know, we, we have uh, clinical informaticists. We don't have associate CMIOs, but we have clinical informaticists that are also serving as uh, point people who uh, continue to, you know, represent um, the needs of, of the clinicians. Um, so that's sort of one area of, one way that we solve that problem. The other is we've, we've also begun to institute a, an IT rounding uh, program. And, and when I say IT rounding, I mean everybody that is an application analyst to, you know, our engineers in the back end so that they can, start, they can see how their work translates uh, and they can understand um, more empathetically what's going on uh, when things are down even for seconds or if there's mm -hmm. an extra click or if there's, you know, a phone call that needs to be made to, 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 to get a ticket. They get a sense of the urgency, uh, you know, during uh, that type of activity. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very much a fan of this notion of a Gemba walk, which is really the inspiration for this IT rounding, um, you know, sort of initiative. And, it's, uh, it's this notion of, uh, you know, being the place where value is created. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I've cre we created that program for IT, and uh, like I said, it enables folks to go out there and partner with their um, clinician partners, um, empathize at some level or sympathize, and then understand. Um, so it's, it's really about um, rounding to understand um, how their impact is, um, is being made and, uh, you know, it's also a great engagement tool, quite honestly, because, you know, it's in these days when you have somebody that's sort of sitting in the cube in the corner uh, working on stuff in isolation, um, you know, it can be uh, at some level, uh, you know, sort of isolating. And so you want to make sure that they're part of the mission and, and they've got line of sight. And so those are two things that, that we've, we've done. The other is, is that we've also um, seek champions and advocates um, uh, you know, for, for not just the clinicians, but also those that understand INT. And so it's, it's sort of a bi-directional um, understanding uh, because, again, part of, part of the, the relationship here is about 
you know, knowing what you need, but the other part is uh, knowing what the others are uh, undergoing to deliver your, your needs um, for your solutions. And so mm-hmm. um, we begin to look for those folks who can sort of, you know, shoulder both sides of, of the coin. Very good. Very good. All right, Sherry, let's start with you. What are some things IT people don't understand about clinicians, either the type of people who go into the field or the type of work they're engaged in that contribute to misunderstanding? So is is there a type that we can describe of a clinician that will help IT people communicate with them? You know, it's interesting because this is a great question, and, and even within nursing, we may say, you know, a NICU nurse is more caring, an OR mm-hmm. nurse, you know, they didn't want to have. But, you know, I, I think it comes down to, at the end of the day, that the majority of clinicians went into healthcare to make a difference in lives. And if they come across, you know, what, what's happened, I see over the years, is many times it's like, okay, let's skip this to the nurse. You know, the nurse can, can show the patient how to use this, or the nurse can, and the nurses have, have kind of over the years become the, you know, if someone doesn't want to do that or who's the right person <laughs> because they're the majority of the time with the patient. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think about that. I don't think it's a type. I think that um, we want to ensure that our patients are, we're the voice of our patients, and we want to be able to, to spend that time with them and, and make a difference. And so I think what sometimes IT folks don't understand, I think it's great, as um, Joel says, they're having folks shadow in that. And, and having done that, even in my role, um, I go out, put scrubs on, and you know spend time with the patient. Many of the times, you're with them when it's someone that either has the time. When things get kind of crazy, you, you go away. What many folks don't realize is, you know, in that 12-hour shift, you could have had, you know, multiple patients die or, mm-hmm. you know, not enough nurses or, you know, you name it. Um, it. It hasn't felt like a very good shift. So I think that really just many of the understand, misunderstandings are we can come across, I'll speak for my fellow nurses, as being, you know, uncooperative at times, but it really comes down to because we're looking out either for our fellow nurses or our patients. And if we really understand the why something is happening to us or to our patients, we can get on board, but let us have, a, you know, a, a say in that. Let's work on it collaboratively and together. That's a great, well said. And Brian, it makes me think of uh, asking for a clinician's time. I would imagine, uh, you know, quite often IT needs a little time with a clinician, and maybe they're not getting the reception they might like, you know, either a meeting or a participate in this committee. But clinicians who are very harried and busy and stressed and maybe dealing with understaffed situations might come across as really uncooperative, as Sherry said, or a little abrupt or unpleasant, but it's because that priority is the patient care and something's pulling me away from this person in the bed who I need to care for. So that's going to take a back seat, right? So what are your thoughts around that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I echo what what Sherry says. You know, a lot of the uh, frustration uh, that we that we hear from clinicians uh, is really, uh, um, uh, if you if you get to the root of it, uh, they're passionate about caring for their patients, and when something is distracting them or preventing them from delivering that care, they get frustrated. And so uh, as IT professionals, we have to understand that, um, that that's their, that, that's their role. That's what, what they're here to do. They're not here to be putting data into the computer. They're not here to be feeding the computer um, or, or dealing with our other systems. They expect things to work so that they can spend as much of their time um, uh, being with their patients and treating their patients uh, and caring for their patients. And so if we understand that that's where their frustration is coming from, then we can, uh, you, you know, we can have some empathy for these, uh, uh, you know, the frustrated person on the other side of the, uh, on the other end of the phone. 
and um, you know they they really want to get back to caring for their patients, and so we just have to make sure that we're we're always keeping that in the back of our minds as as we're dealing with folks, and and work around their schedules, not around ours. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I make sure that when uh, when we uh, deliver training to our end users. We like to do as much at the elbow training or uh, at the elbow uh, 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 support as possible, um, because we uh, don't expect uh, our our providers and our nurses to uh, um, uh, pull out, uh, you, you know, go to a classroom to get trained on something. Uh, we really should be delivering that training to them uh, at a time that's convenient for them, not at a time that's convenient for us. Uh, and to again optimizing their time spent with their patients and and with care, uh, and uh, bending over backwards on our end to meet their needs rather than having them, uh, you know, come to a specific class or something like that. And Joel, Anthony, thoughts about Sherry. Oh, go ahead, yep. Sherry. Go ahead, Sherry. Then we'll I go just to Joel. Go to ahead, add, Sherry. Yeah, great. I want to add one thing because I think what um, really has been tough for nursing over the years, we are hourly employees. The nurse at the bedside, right? And with, you know, cuts and always looking at with nurses being the largest workforce, um, nurses want to be involved in on um, committees or provide their input, but there could be times that your organization, you know, has really limited that. So there isn't the ability to have a good representation either across your organization. I think we've all worked through that. But the other piece is we also expect the nurse at the bedside to learn because rarely can we get them in a classroom. So during that 12-hour shift when they're caring for the patient, trying to look at their emails or communication that's, that's um, come out, they're not only doing that, on top of it, they're trying to read those tip sheets, get those pieces of information, then take that and use it with either that, that new technology or new feature functionality that we've rolled out. So I think well, I don't have an answer for it um, at this point. I've really you know, been talking to our chief nurses about how do we give our, our nurses the time that they need. Can everybody get you know, an extra one or two hours a month or something of, of that sort in order to help prepare them for some of these changes? Yeah, it can be tough because the, sometimes the staffing is so thin that when you pull someone off the floor, you've left the floor short. Right, Sherry? Yep, right. So Correct. That's, that's the challenge. Uh, Joel, your thoughts on uh, some of this stuff? Yeah, you know, it's, it, it just brings to, to mind, uh, you know, sort of the, the continued evolution of, of IT. And as Sherry pointed out earlier, you know, in the 90s, IT was really kind of just a service provider in many ways. You know, it's sort of the electrical company. Um, and, 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 you know, you, you use it to turn the lights on, if you will, or to power the lights. But more than ever, uh, it's becoming integral to the way that we deliver care and the way that we practice. And, uh, and it's, so it's, it's, it's super important for us to really become more collaborative and become more engaged. And I think as Sherry pointed out, it's, re it's about relationships in many ways, but also it's about understanding. And so, and I point that out because I, I think now more than ever, um, you know, the clinician and an IT relationship has to be strong, it has to be transparent, it has to be collaborative, um, and, and both have to work together. Um, you know, we don't get up in, in the morning, we being the IT folks, don't get up in the morning and say, you know what, how can I make that button harder to find, and how can I make this workflow much more difficult? You know what I mean? Like, we, we get up in the morning, we say, geez, I, I, how can I solve this problem? And so, and they do that, by the way, they, I think the IT folks will, will say that they, they work many hours trying to solve problems and, and trying to, um, to, to work with clinicians and help clinicians do their job. Uh, and so it's that understanding, I think, that, that needs to, to, to be put on the table so that we can then work together to say, hey, look, we're on the same team. We're trying to solve the same problem. How can we solve that problem? Uh, because oftentimes it can be contentious because, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stake being in, in, in the health system, right? especially for clinicians. And so as IT, we have to understand that we have to, we have to recognize that. Uh, but also as, as clinicians and IT together, we have to recognize that we have to do this together. We can try to solve problems together. Um, and, 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 you know, as IT professionals, we have to figure out vehicles and ways to help clinicians solve the problem, not just the immediate problem, 
but problems going forward. And, and, and I think that's really the challenge for a lot of us in IT. It's not about just keeping the lights on anymore. It's about trying to figure out, okay, here's the problem. How do we create a sustainable solution going forward? That's really the challenge for us in the, in, in the future of IT. And I also say that because IT will become more and more commodity in terms of just the, the sort of the day-to-day -day as we start to outsource stuff, you know, more as we start to, um, you know, create more types of, uh, you know, automation uh, within the workflows. Those things are going to be automated, so we have to step up our game to help clinicians solve the problems for the sake of the patients. Yeah, Joel, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And, and, and to your point earlier about getting people out in the field, um, one of the key things you, uh, that we make sure we're doing is getting people out and observing those workflows. Uh, because we may design something that we think is great uh, uh, back in the shop, uh, and when we put that out uh, out in uh, in production, uh, we may be messing with some other part of somebody's workflow. Uh, and so, a making sure that as we're designing those uh, new workflows, we're getting clinician input. But as we as we put them out there, go out and observe and see are people doing some workarounds um, that we didn't foresee that because of something we didn't foresee, or are they are they uh, is their workflow being disrupted because of uh, something that we put into that workflow? And so getting out and just doing those observations, sitting at the elbow of somebody, walking, watching them through a day of their, their life, uh, uh, getting ideas on how to improve efficiency, but also understanding um, this is how we built it, but this is how it's being used, uh, and getting more ideas on how to improve those workflows and continually to evolve the EHR uh, uh, to uh, uh, make that, that uh, uh, end, user, end user's life more efficient. Yeah, you know, I think that's, that's super important, Brian. I think that's a great point, you know, and, and it's this no notion that Gartner has sort of begun to try to push out there, which is to say, you know, can we go from project management to product management? You know, traditional IT is about project. It's about implementing stuff and then going on to the next. Um, and, and that kind of creates this, this sort of, you know, uh, notion of, you know, not optimizing something because you've gotten across the finish line and then you go to the next one to try to run that race. But what we have to really do is, is really focus on product management. You know, don't stop at implementation. To your point, look and observe and try to figure out how do we optimize that even further. You know, there are workarounds that are occurring that we didn't anticipate. How do we make sure that you know, those are, are not kind of the, the norm, and, and we can focus on optimizing the workflow further. So it's about that kind of evolution of, of IT that I think we need to, to really begin to look at, particularly for healthcare, because, you know, it's, it's ever-changing, it's transforming, and, you know, yesterday's implementation is going to be tomorrow's, you know, black eye, right? So yeah, yep, absolutely. we need to focus on it. Yeah. Yep. All right, and very good. I want to jump down to our Ask a Co-Panelist question, which is one of my favorites. So um, let's start off with who am I going to put in the hot seat first? My friend Joel. Let's, <laughs> let's start off with my friend Joel. Joel, a oh, question God. for either or both of your co-panelists um, that will enlighten us all. Well, I, okay, so I, I have maybe for both uh, Sherry and, um, and Brian then. So, you know, if you were to if you were to state one thing that is a is a big no no for a CIO to to do, uh, what would that be? And that could be anything, but but certainly you know one CIO no no that I would I would love to hear from my fellow CNI or CMIO. Brian, why don't you go first? Yeah, I mean I I think it's really uh, just about not getting input early. Um, I think the earlier you get input from your end users, the better off your solutions are going to be. Um, and so even from product selection or project selection uh, on down through the implementation and, uh, and then optimization, uh, it's getting continual f uh, feedback. Uh, and so uh, failing to get that feedback or listen to that feedback uh, is, is, is the biggest no-no. And so uh, getting feedback early and often uh, is key. Very good. Sherry? Yeah, what I would say, and, and I don't know at Baycare if you have this, my, mine is um, 
to make sure that you have a CNIO and a CMIO. If you have one and not the other, mm -hmm. um, that creates a disparity in my mind. And then also the three um, leaders work very closely together, you know, creating that, that strategy um, around the, the clinicians. Yeah, absolutely. That's interesting, Echo that. Sherry, the, the CNIO, CMIO disparity, so, so definitely have uh, the, the combination, you think, because that, that seems to, to create equitability in, in workflow and, and, and implementation. Is that the idea? Yes, yes, correct. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just, right, because what I'm, I'm seeing, um, while there, there's been an increase in the CNIO role, there are many organizations I've talked to that have a CMIO and not a CNIO. And, you know, that would be like having a CNO without a CMO, right? As, as a leadership team, whether it's, it's the overall or if it's specific around um, that technology, I, I feel it's important because what is that shared to your nursing staff if they see a leader, that physician leader at that C-suite and they don't see a nursing leader there? Well, let me, can I ask one other provocative question, Anthony? If Please. I might? Um, so, Sherry and, and Brian, do you think there's a need for a CIO if a CMIO or CNIO exists? Yes. Oh, ab absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's a, yep. it's a great triumvirate, so, you know, uh, uh, understanding the technology, understanding physician workflows, understanding nursing workflows and issues, uh, I think that the, those are all key roles uh, within the organization. And, uh, you know, the, the, the CIO is always going to be uh, a that that driver for change. Oftentimes, the the CMIO or CNIO really don't have a seat at that executive table, uh, whereas the CIO typically does. And so, being that voice of continuing to evolve the organization's uh, uh, technology and infrastructure, um, and um, um, making sure that there's, uh, you know, adequate uh, support for the applications uh, is that we're able to maintain and optimize those ap uh, uh, applications over time. I think a lot of times this, uh, uh, the uh, uh, C-suite might forget that, you know, like you said, rather than project management, it's, it's it, it, it's product management, and that optimization piece takes a lot of time and effort, uh, and you don't typically uh, submit a capital budget for that, you know. Uh, it's not a new project, uh, but it's something that's ongoing and it's work that you have to do, and that takes takes time and bodies to do that, and being that voice at that table to, uh, to make sure that that's a, uh, an understanding of the organization is critical. Sherry, anything else there, or are you good? No, no, I think I, I totally agree. I, I, I totally agree with what Brian said. I feel there needs to be the three. Um, and I, I think um, I've been at a couple different organizations, and I think with that right leadership, it, it's a great triad. So we need CIOs. <laughs> good. So, Joel, you're good. You're good for now. All right, good. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that snippet and give it to my boss. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Sherry, did you have a question for one or both of your co-panelists? Um, I guess um, I would just I ask a little bit. We talked about, about are, are you guys using any um, data analytics we talked about as we roll out, whether it's a new piece of technology or um, enhancement? Uh, how do you know it's being used, you know, so we don't stop at it, it's live and now we go on to the next thing? Um, are you using data analytics to ensure that that new feature functionality is being utilized? Yeah, absolutely. Not only utilized, but having the effect that you expect. Um, you know, and so anything that we're rolling out that's new, uh, I really say, how are we going to measure success? Um, and so working with our analytics team uh, and our decision support team uh, to make sure that, okay, here's our expected outcome. Are we achieving that? Um, and so you can have process measures, utilization measures, uh, but also outcome measures to make sure that, uh, that you're impacting what you expected to impact. And so uh, I lean on our analytics team very, very heavily uh, to make sure that we understand um, 
You know, and it's also about uh, being able to show the positive impact you're having on the organization. Uh, you know, we made some changes in how uh, billing was captured behind the scenes rather than requiring physicians to enter the billing. Uh, we were able to capture a lot of that behind the scenes, and, and we were able to show, you know, the economic I impact to the organization by making some of those changes. Uh, and so not only um, uh, uh, is something being used, but is it having the outcome that you expect? Joel? Yeah, I, I, would, I would echo that. Uh, two things that we try to measure. Uh, one is uh, as we put together a, a project or a product, we, uh, you know, I ask my team, you know, what's the value? So that value has to be measurable. And so whatever that value is, you need to see. You need to have a metric that that can um, can measure that value, uh, and then the second is is about adoption. Um, uh, and and so as, as Brian had mentioned, uh, you know I think many organizations are starting to do this, and certainly vendors are starting to provide tools uh, to enable you to to measure adoption or utilization. And so, uh, you know, our current EHR has that that capability uh, where we can actually go down to the provider level. And, and find out, you know, how much pajama time uh, do they have uh, every night? Uh, how, how long are they um, in the in the record documenting um, during the, the, the a patient um, a visit? So these are things that we're starting to, uh, to to look at more deeply, and that enables us to evolve these products and hopefully optimize them. Uh, because again, in the past, it was you know let's implement and then let's move on. Uh, now we right. really need to make sure we understand uh, what's going on so we can evolve uh, the, 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 the workflow, the design, um, so that we can make it better for our clinicians. Brian, a question for, for your panelists, for your co-panelists? Uh, I don't think I have any other questions at this point. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, it's been an engaging conversation, so it's, uh, it's been fun. Excellent. Well, I think that is a good spot for us to wrap. So, um, if you have continuing education interest in today's event, attending our webinars gets you one CEU towards the CHIME CHCIO certification program, so let CHIME know you were here. If you've asked us to do so, we certainly will. If you need a certificate of attendance for another CEU program, you can use the final slide in this deck. You'll receive an email when our archive recording of this event has been posted to our YouTube channel. If you'd like us to produce a webinar on the topic of your choice, you can contact Nancy Wilcox from our team, and you can visit our website to view our upcoming schedule. So with that, I want to thank our panelists, Sherry Hess, Brian, Dr. Brian Patty, and Joel Venko, and I want to thank you, our attendees, for continuing to enjoy our events. So with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you.